morning. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Today we continue our Easter celebration. This morning in God's Word, we see how our risen Savior brings peace to lives that are filled with trouble and fear. And we see that we can share that same message of peace with others. This morning, we'll be following the order of service called Morning Praise. And we join now in our opening hymn, Hymn 143. Please stand. O oh Lord, open my lips. And my mouth shall be right Hasten to save me, O oh God.
Please be seated. Our first lesson for the second Sunday of Easter is recorded in Acts chapter 3. After healing a crippled beggar, Peter points to the source of the healing, the risen Lord and Savior. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Men of Israel, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disown the holy and righteous one and ask that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has given this complete healing to him, as you can all see. Now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Christ would suffer. Repent, then, and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Christ who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. We now join in the psalm of the day, Psalm 16. is recorded in 1st John chapter 5. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Son of God shares in his victory over sin and the grave. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. 
This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out His commands. This is love for God, to obey His commands. And His commands are not burdensome, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the Gospel. The Gospel for the second Sunday of Easter is recorded in John chapter 20, beginning with verse 19. Jesus appears to his disciples first on Easter evening and then a week later. Thomas, who was not present on the first occasion, was there on the second appearing. And after seeing his risen Lord, he proclaimed, My Lord and my God. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. We continue with the hymn of the day, hymn 165. Please note that we'll sing verses 1 and verses 4 through 9.
Grace and peace to you from our crucified and risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, the joy of our Easter celebration last Sunday is still ringing in our ears. The triumphant shouts of Alleluia, Christ is risen, He is risen indeed, remain on the lips of God's people. We continue to to share the joy and the amazement of the women who went to the tomb that, that Sunday morning and found Jesus' tomb empty. This morning in our gospel, we heard how Jesus appeared to his disciples on that Sunday evening when they were hiding behind locked doors out of fear of the Jews. Jesus surprised them and appeared to them and prove that he had indeed been raised from the dead, just as he promised. And then we are told the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Jesus then commissioned his disciples to be his witnesses in the world. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. A few months later, after Jesus ascended into heaven, And after the special outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, we see Jesus' disciples keeping that command from Jesus. In our sermon text for today from Acts chapter 3, we see an example of this as Peter and John share the good news of the risen Savior. In the verses right before our sermon text, Peter and John crossed paths with a crippled beggar who was carried to the temple gate every day to beg from those who were coming into the temple courts. And when this crippled beggar saw John and Peter, he asked them for money. And Peter replied, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. As a result of this miraculous healing, a crowd of people gathered in amazement. This man had been crippled from birth. The people knew him very well because they passed by him every day on the way into the temple courts. But now he was walking and jumping and praising God. And that brings us to the question that Peter asked the people. Men of Israel, why does this surprise you? It's kind of a strange question, isn't it? Why wouldn't they be surprised that this man who was crippled his entire life was now walking and jumping? Well, the reason why Peter asked that question is that the people seemed to think that John and Peter possessed a special power that enabled them to heal this man. And so Peter asked the people, why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? And so Peter then goes on to correct them, but he does so in a rather surprising way. Basically, Peter tells the people, you think this is amazing, and it is, but God has done something even more amazing. Now, before I tell you what God has done, I first want to tell you what you have done. Before Peter could share the good news of God's amazing love in providing a Savior, he first pointed out their sin and their need for that Savior. Peter told them, The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate though he had decided to let him go. You disown the Holy and Righteous One and ask that a murderer be released to you. 
You killed the author of life. Wow. Talk about hitting them upside the head with the two by four of God's law. I mean, Peter doesn't mince any words here. He accused them of murder. And not just murdering another human being, he accused them of murdering the author of life, the Son of God himself. These are are certainly harsh words from Peter. But like any good preacher, you wonder if Peter wasn't first preaching those words to himself. After all, it wasn't that long ago that Peter was the one who said that he would always be there for Jesus, right? He would even lay down his life for Jesus. But then Peter denied knowing Jesus three times. And after the rooster crowed, the Gospel of Luke tells us, the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. And then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Like the crowd of people, Peter knew what it was like to be crushed by God's holy law. And so Peter must have found great joy in sharing with these people the next truth. When he said, but God raised him from the dead. That is the heart and core of the Easter message that we celebrated last week. And that we rejoice in each and every day. Christ is risen. Peter knew this because, as he said, he was a witness of this. Peter was one of the disciples in that room hiding behind locked doors when Jesus appeared to them and said, Peace be with you. Peter, the one who had disowned Jesus, received that message of peace from Jesus himself. He received the forgiveness of sins. And so does it surprise you then that Peter is now sharing that same message of peace with the people who murdered Jesus? No, it shouldn't. That's the reason why Peter brought all of this up to begin with. It wasn't to shame these people and then send them away in hopelessness and despair so that they would go home and hide behind locked doors waiting for judgment day to come when Jesus would sentence them to eternal death in hell. No. Rather, Peter shared this with them because he wanted them to see that even though they had waged a foolish war against the author of life, against God himself, They could still have peace because look at what God did with their ignorance. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Christ would suffer. Now, God did not force these people to do what they did to Jesus. He did not cause their ignorance, which led them to crucify Jesus. But through their ignorant actions, God did accomplish what had to happen because God's word had prophesied. This was God's way of delivering all sinners from eternal death. And now through Peter, God was holding out that forgiveness, that peace to sinners. Peace that came from the very cross that Jesus, the Son of God, was put to death on. How surprising is that? It's surprising because it's something undeserved. It's something that we can't understand or or make sense of with our human reason. But this is how God deals with sinners. It is how he deals with you and me. Perhaps we didn't deny knowing Jesus three times like Peter did. Or disown him and ask that he be crucified like the people of Israel did. But their sins are no worse than ours. We have no excuse. We have no ignorance to blame. We know what God's will is for our lives. 
We have His written word. We have His laws and His commands, and yet we still sin. We know that we don't deserve the peace that God offers us. I mean, look at what we do and what we fail to do in our lives. Like Peter, we too should weep bitterly over our sins. And yet, here is Peter sharing the good news of the gospel. Christ is risen. And he shares that good news with sinners. Because that is what God meant in John 3.16 when he said, For God so loved the world. His love wasn't limited to just a few people. It was meant for all, even for those who shouted crucify him. Now that is grace. That is God's undeserved love that did everything necessary to provide us with peace when he sacrificed his own son on the cross. But in order to to see the good news of what our Savior has done for us, we first need to see our sin and our need for that Savior. And that is why Peter encouraged the people, repent then and turn to God. Peter acknowledged the people's ignorance in putting Jesus to death. But that ignorance did not equal innocence. And so he called them to repent, to turn away from their sin and to turn in faith to God for forgiveness. And look at what Peter said would happen. He said, repent so that your sins may be wiped out. That is the power of Jesus' name. It healed a man who had been born crippled. But even more incredible is that in the name of Jesus, our crucified and risen Savior, all of our sins have been completely wiped out. It's like an enormous chalkboard or whiteboard that has every single sin we've ever committed written on it and every single sin that we will commit written on it. And now God comes along with his eraser and he wipes it completely clean. They are completely gone. As far as the east is from the west. And God will never bring them up again. Thanks to Jesus. So does it still surprise you, the the grace and the forgiveness that God offers us? Does it surprise you that every day we can repent of our sins and turn in faith to Jesus for forgiveness? I hope it does. I hope that you never take God's grace for granted. I hope that every day we are surprised at and amazed at God's never-ending love, which sacrificed His own Son for the world. And for you and me. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God which surpasses all our understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We now join to confess our faith by singing, We praise you, O God.
In the morning, O Lord, I call to you. Be merciful to me and hear my prayer. We join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. God of all grace, we thank you for the gift of eternal life in your Son. By the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, and by the faithful testimony of the apostles, you have assured us that our faith stands on a sure and solid foundation. Though we do not see Jesus with our physical eyes, Help us see him with the eyes of faith. Through your Holy Spirit, breathe on your church that it may faithfully proclaim the gospel of our risen Savior with courage and diligence in all lands and to all people. Grant that we also may be illumined by the heavenly light of your word and so keep us in the one and only true faith. Preserve us from all assaults on our souls. Deliver us from doubt and despair and preserve us from worldly wisdom and false teaching. Forgive the sins of your people. Strengthen the doubting and faithless. Bring back the forgetful and wayward, and comfort the anxious and the distressed. As we go from this holy place today, grant peace and rest to us all. We pray this in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. We continue with hymn 341.
Please stand for prayer. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us safely to this new day. Defend us with your mighty power and grant that this day we neither fall into sin nor run into any kind of danger. And in all we do, direct us to what is right in your sight through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Let us praise the Lord. Be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Please be seated. Good morning once again. We're glad that you could all join us for worship this morning. Thank you to all of you who helped with our service this morning. Uh, just a reminder, as you saw on the church calendar, a week from this coming, from this Wednesday will be our next uh, voters meeting. That will be uh, Wednesday at 7.30 at night. It will be a Zoom meeting. So not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday, 7.30 at night will be our next quarterly uh, voters meeting. Uh, and just a reminder, some of you have, have asked about it. At this time, we're asking that people still sign up for church. Uh, right now, the AOE needs to consider what we would do if we don't have sign up and we get more people than we can safely hold. What do we do with them, right? Uh, we, we don't want to necessarily send them back home, so we need to think through what we would do. So at this time, please remember to, to continue to sign up for worship. We did add another pew. This one down front is open for you, so... Uh, those of you who, who are, are brave enough can come down front and, and sit here. Um, so it is one additional pew as opposed to what we had before. So just keep that in mind as well. And as soon as we, we figure out how to, to deal with any potential overflow, we will let you know and let you know when we can stop signing up for worship. Although I know it's become a part of your, your weekly routine now, so it'll be hard to, to break that habit. But. 
Lord's blessings on the rest of your week as we continue to rejoice in our Savior's victory over the grave.